Cities are often framed as evolving living systems. Then why do we design them to be fixed and permanent? Cities are planned as static elements that last for decades, roads, buildings, canals, train lines. However, the way we use cities is anything but static. So the presumption of permanence raises questions. Where do transient populations live? Who decides how common space is used? And what happens in the unplanned spaces? But more importantly, is it time for a new theory of urbanism, particularly in developing countries like India? Welcome to Ecogradia, where we meet experts and practitioners at the front lines of sustainable architecture and urbanism. My name is Nirmal Kishnani. I'm a sustainable design strategist, author and educator based in Singapore. My guest today is Rahul Mehrotra, a professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and founder principal of RMA Architects India. Rahul splits his time between two very different worlds, Boston and Mumbai, engaged in teaching and practice. The answer he seeks, specific to India, but which I think affects much of the developing world, is how cities should be planned to accommodate the inherent flux. He challenges the orthodoxy of fixed urbanism rooted in the car, which he says has destroyed much of the life in cities he knows and loves. The kinetic city, a term he coined, is one that makes room for the impermanent and the unplanned. Of course, this begs the question of what kinetic urbanism looks like, what happens when ideas like this meet the inertia of practice and policy. But don't expect easy answers. The battle for the better city, he says, continues. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the projects discussed or would like to know more about some of the ideas discussed in this interview, go to ecogradia.com to view notes, pictures and links that we have compiled on the episode page. This first season of Ecogradia is sponsored by the Holson Foundation for Sustainable Construction. The foundation was created in 2003 to empower a community of future makers through the transfer of ideas, knowledge and real-world solutions. Next year, we'll see the start of a new cycle of the Holson Awards, which is the most significant prize for sustainable construction in the world today. Go to holsonfoundation.org to find out more. Rahul, welcome. Glad to have you on. Let's start with where you started. Where did you grow up and what got you interested in architecture? I grew up in uh, largely in the city of Mumbai. I was born in Delhi. I lived for a couple of years in the city of Lucknow. Uh, and then I think from the third grade or from about the age of eight or nine, uh, I was really based in Mumbai. Uh, my father worked with a company, a company that made machine tools. Uh, and that's what took him to move different places as he got promoted in different roles uh, in the company. Uh, and then when we lived in Mumbai, as uh, he moved uh, within the company, Company and he was promoted. He got a bigger apartment. We moved to many different parts of Mumbai. I think uh, we moved something like four or five homes in the seven or eight years I was in school in Mumbai. And that really got me interested in architecture, actually in interior design to start with, because every time we moved homes, my mother and I were the only ones who were excited about moving homes because we were rearranging things. Uh, everyone else found it to be really painful. And at some point when I, you know, was in the seventh or eighth grade, I, 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 I thought, my God, interior design would be a great thing. And some architect friends or some architect friends of my parents finally advised me that, look, uh, consider architecture, that's broader. Uh, and when I began to look at what architecture involved, I, I, for me, it was just like obvious, that's what I should be doing. Where did you school? Uh, what was your um, uh, undergraduate degree where? Where did you do that? I went to study architecture at the age of 17 uh, to Ahmedabad, to Sept uh, uh, in Ahmedabad. And uh, that was uh, also a really life-changing experience because having grown up in a place like Mumbai, I'll never forget, I took the overnight train to Ahmedabad to do my entrance exam. Uh, and, uh, you know, I remember landing there at about 6.30 in the morning and took an auto rickshaw and got to the campus at Sept and suddenly one for the first time really experienced a campus because in a city like Mumbai, colleges were embedded in the fabric of the city and the notion of campus mm. didn't exist. And as a 17 year old, that was very impressionable. And, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, and SEPT opened up a whole new uh, way of looking at life, I guess. Well, you had um, several pivot moments in your career, did you not? Um, you, you met Rajiv Gandhi, 
Okay, so for me, the next sort of moment in this sort of professional development experience was coming to Harvard to study uh, urban design. I was lucky that Rajiv Gandhi, who was then the Prime Minister of India, one of the youngest Prime Ministers of India, very dynamic. He had a whole coterie around him uh, who were pushing him into opening up the information technology sector. And Rajiv Gandhi visited Boston and he spoke um, at Memorial Hall, which is a very important venue on the campus for, you know, important speakers. And I remember going to that and um, and his whole coterie of IT folks, everyone is around and, it, you know, there was such excitement, at least for me, uh, because it, this was his famous speech, which he called, I too had a dream. And this was his famous speech, which, uh, you know, uh, resonated Martin Luther King's, I, I have a dream. And it was Rajiv Gandhi said, I too have a dream. And it was about how he saw India in the future. And for me, you know, uh, it was so inspiring. Uh, I didn't have the opportunity to meet him one on one, but we were all in the same room. Uh, but it was so inspiring that I didn't even think twice. As soon as I graduated, I worked for a few months just to gain some basic experience, uh, maybe be nine months uh, and flew back to India to work in India because it was such an exciting moment. Mm. Mm. And and how long after that before you set up RMA? This is your firm. We started our practice in August 1990 and the first three or four years of the practice as in, in many, many big city is really about interiors and interior renovation. I mean, you know, no one gives you a building. Uh, and then when you're lucky, you get your first house in some remote area, which is a weekend house for someone you know. And so our practice started in exactly that way. The first three, four years were really uh, mainly interior renovations and projects like that. At that point, I also got very interested in conservation because Bombay had a uh, you know, incredible landscape of historic buildings. I had many friends, mainly non-architects, actually all non-architects, who were <laughs> listing buildings. They were trying to save these historic colonial buildings in Mumbai. What, what exactly is your role at the Harvard GSC? Uh, I was asked to come in as the chair of the Department of Urban Planning and Design. And that took me a little bit of thinking. Uh, and finally, I accepted uh, to do that because I realized that, you know, while my practice was focused on architecture, my interests, my research interests, my writing interests, my activism interests were all related right. to the city. So I thought, what an opportunity to really uh, begin to understand this in a more expansive way. And so I came to Harvard as the chair of the department. So it meant a lot of administrative roles, hiring people, trying to set up curricula and all of that. But I also teach there and I teach uh, uh, and extend my own research, which is based in India. So all my teaching, my research, my classes are linked to things I'm doing in India. You've been a critic of uh, the modernist industrial paradigm. Uh, you call for a rethink of planning. The phrase that is most associated with you is the kinetic city. Um, what exactly is the kinetic city? Nirmal, uh, the idea of the kinetic city came uh, from uh, a kind of reaction when I went back after studying urban design from uh, the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University back to uh, Bombay. Uh, I began to see that what I was seeing on the ground was almost at odds with what I had studied. And essentially, of course, after much um, uh, writing, research, conversations, one realized and uh, one realized that really what modernism had done was that it had instrumentalized architecture in incredibly powerful ways in the making of the city, right? Uh, but the city is not only about architecture. And that becomes very clear when one interrogates the city anywhere in Asia, actually. It's partly got to do with the climate. It's partly got to do with the acute inequities that exist in our societies, that people occupy space in unorchestrated ways, or seemingly unorchestrated ways, right? So mm. I began to also respond at that point to the fetishizing of the slum uh, and the fetishizing of the informal uh, in a way that people were looking only at settlements. In cities, the holy trinity is 
livelihoods, dwelling and mobility, right? In the classic Singapore shop house, mobility gets reduced to one flight of stairs. But then in our cities today, mobility gets very elastic because dwelling and livelihoods get differentiated. And I thought, my God, how can we just talk about the informal economy or how can we just talk about slums by just looking at the slum as a spatial entity? It has to be contextualized in the city. And therefore, one began to look at modes that people were using for livelihoods, whether it was forms of vending, whether it was temporary markets that appeared early in the morning and disappeared in an hour. Now, the the question, of course, was also that a lot of the theory that we were alluding to and had been taught and continue to be taught is theory that emanates about reflecting on the industrializing West in the last century, right? And theory is about reflecting about what we see around us. So really the real urban theory should be coming out of Africa, out of Asia, out of India or South Asia, because this is where the action is on the ground. And I would argue even the Middle East, right? Because these are taking new forms of urbanism in a sense, not only in terms of its architectural architectural articulation, but also how people occupy space. And so the idea of the kinetic city came from trying to uh, infect um, uh, the debate uh, on urbanization, which was sort of very much driven by the reflections of what's happening in the West, but also trying to make more central to the conversation how cities are also about the associative values that people bring to space uh, in a city. And so therefore also looking at it through the eye of a human-centric imagination. And I think for me, that was the shift that I got very interested in. Uh, then that expanded uh, with my work at Harvard by teaching courses where I took kinetic and made it ephemeral and took city and made it urbanism so that it could be much more it could be much broader as a theoretical framework and then within that we developed taxonomies like the ephemeral landscapes of refuge which are refugee camps the ephemeral landscapes of transactions which are markets uh, again a global phenomena uh, the uh, ephemeral landscapes of celebration of religion, of, of strife, um, you know, of extraction, of military. So we created a whole taxonomy where one could place uh, what one was seeing as these sorts of temporal occupations of space and seeing what one can learn from that. And right. the, the learnings, uh, just to distill that, uh, you know, are manifold. Uh, of course, it is about ways of making. It's about ways of making economically. It's about ways of touching the ground uh, lightly. Uh, there are many, many lessons one can extract which would resonate more broadly within the city. This is not an argument that all cities should be temporary, but it's an argument that within our imagination of cities, we've got to recalibrate how instrumental architecture is and how we can occupy space for certain sorts of uses on a temporal cycle more likely. Very specifically, maybe in land use planning, every plot should not be occupied by a building, but there should be plots or parcels of land in a city that should be attributed to temporal uses. And other very specific recommendation could be that land uses are based on 10-year cycles, which means then people even build buildings which have a 10-year lifespan and the material and is, is, is imagined in a way that it can be recycled or upcycled or reused, right? So we kind of then begin to have parts of the city that don't get locked into permanence in terms of our imagination of how we embody our resources. Give me an example of what that looks like. A physical, a, 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 a spatial condition of where time is a vector in planning. Yeah. So I will take uh, the, the easiest one and then we can look at more complex ones is what I use as a case, uh, a, a case in point in the city of Mumbai, which is how uh, the maidans, which are the cricket fields in the evenings get used for wedding, right? Now, now that can be done informally or you can actually formalize that like as multiple land uses. So you can have a land use for 
or a parcel of land which is a daytime land use and you can have a parcel of land which has a nighttime land use, right? On a longer durée, we can get into issues of what we call the life cycle of buildings. We as architects are very lazy about that. Well, let's say we as society are very lazy about that. Everything we build, we build with some notion of it being permanent. Now, what does permanent even mean? That is also a comparative thing, right? So, if, you know, in the same way as uh, the, there are many metrics uh, for sustainability, for green buildings, um, the lead uh, now in India, Graha and many localized sorts of metrics, uh, one could have the same for the life cycle of buildings. Why are we designing all the buildings with some crazy assumption of time for how long they will last, right? We could right. be designing buildings to say this building is designed to last for 10 years or for 15 years or for 20 years. We can do that very precisely with the technologies that we have today. And so that mm -hmm. is a, a, a more complicated scale where it's not just a parcel of land which can be used for cricket in the day and weddings at night, but it's also at the city level, there are many parcels uh, that uh, are locked in to these sorts of temporal cycles. The way I would phrase that is, in our cities, we are often making permanent solutions for temporary problems. Uh, and uh, we, we don't ask the durée of the problem or the requirement. So in America, for example, now there are over 2,000 shopping malls in the suburbs that are abandoned. 10 acres of land with big buildings and parking lots. They're just abandoned because, and the same is for the Olympic stadiums around the world where massive infrastructure is invested in, but it's abandoned. It's hardly used after because there is no need for it in some of those locations, right? We should be having pneumatic structures that like a circus go from town to town every time an Olympics is announced. Uh, so, you know, we, 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 I think we are as society, given all the crises we are facing on this planet, ready to think about architecture in our cities like that. Not completely to start with, at least in part. You talk about uh, urbanization being an elastic condition. Now, what does that uh, the, the idea of not having grand, grand visions, but rather grand adjustments. Yeah. I mean, again, uh, give an example of what that looks like in planning. You know, the question that you asked, Nirmal, is, is very interesting. Uh, and, you know, this notion of how do we move away from a grand vision to a grand adjustment? The implication of that is that uh, we, I mean, we should be, you know, critiquing the way we approach planning, which is always through absolute solutions, right? Uh, and what I mean by an absolute solution is a solution which identifies a problem, it locks the problem in time, and then it comes up with a solution which will perhaps be a solution often arrogant, arrogantly assumed uh, for perpetuity, correct? Now, the point is we have to also think about transitions because all problems as we define them are not permanent. Let me give you the example of the energy situation in India. Uh, you know, of course, India for the last 20 years, and this is something that at least came to my mind when Manmohan Singh was our prime minister, which is now 10 years ago or more, uh, which is that you know, India wanted to move from fossil fuels to renewables, right? Now, India can't make uh, the jump from fossil fuels to renewables because our economy will collapse. And so you make the transition, say, through nuclear. So that's why we call it energy transitions, because you have to go into other modes that make the disruptions very minimal. I think we have to use those kinds of uh, ideas to bring to our cities too, because even our cities are in most parts of the world, uh, maybe in Singapore, for example, you can predict uh, things more closely because it's it's more tied in space and time. But in a country like India, uh, with now 1.3 billion people, and we are going to be uh, exceeding even China's population, there is a lot of flux in our urban landscape, which means people, it, the, the predictability of who's going to finally settle where is almost impossible, right? And flux so between what? So there's a lot of flux in the urban landscape between what we call in our political jargon, rural and urban, people moving back and forth for jobs, for example. Uh, but mm -hmm. often it's not permanent commitments. People come in sometimes for four or five years. And a great indication of that was the pandemic where our government stupidly only announced the lockdown 24 or 48 hours advance of when they bought the lockdown down and people had to walk home. So 
Conservative estimates say that about 30 million people walked back to their villages because of the lockdown, which tells you how not very permanently they are invested in the city, right? Home was elsewhere. Uh, and this is a seasonal migration. This is migration sometimes for five or 10 years to earn enough money to set up a business in wherever they come from, a small town or a village. So there's a lot of flux with, 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 with climate change, climate migration. This is going to be accelerated in different ways. It will not be the clear rural urban. In fact, even the rural urban binary in my view is a useless category in a place like India. It has completely blurred because the small towns, which we haven't mapped adequately, actually house more than three, four hundred million people, uh, uh, you know, in real terms. Uh, and these will also become centers of employment. So we don't know how this crazy, really unprecedented urban scale uh, uh, unprecedented population scale, which is now going to exceed China uh, with, with less territory in terms of physical land, how it will finally settle. So why would we want to lock our cities into permanent configurations? In fact, we should be making space in our cities at all levels uh, where we have this kind of temporal art articulation, where, for example, even housing types, we are locked into the one, two, three, four bedroom hall and kitchen paradigm and metric. That assumes a nuclear family at different economic mobility levels, right? We should be talking about YMCA types, dharamshalas or dormitories or co-housing or community living where migrants in cycles can come, live, share, uh, you know, co-produce, uh, etc. So even in terms of housing typologies, we've got to really nuance our imagination. And that is all about transitionary thinking where we know we are making a transition to something, but we are not even sure what that might be. And therefore, we have to be really careful in our cities to not ambitiously accelerate the process of growth and building and lock it into paradigms, but rather think more in temporal terms, in terms of transitions, which will help us actually deal with these problems, I believe, uh, much better. And this is where looping back to the kinetic city, to the ephemeral, I think we can learn and extract from what we observe people doing quite naturally, instinctively, uh, and some of them being cultural practices that have occurred for many, many generations and centuries uh, to inform the culture of city making and city imagining today. Has, has the, um, the idea of Indian urbanism progressed much? I mean, you, you quite rightly talk about how there needs to be a, um, um, a conversation of urbanism that comes out of this emerging economies, but has it has it has it changed much since Chandigarh? I mean, uh, uh, what what has been what have been the models of Indian urbanism that have found traction since Chandigarh? No, that Nirmal is a very good question, and my short answer to you through the sixties and seventies. The critiques of Chandigarh were immense as a city. Uh, you know, wide roads, everyone scorching in the sun. But the buildings were beautiful. It had a very distinct I identity. What I learned from Chandigarh, because I've gone to Chandigarh three or four times just before the pandemic. And my God, I really think it's the most wonderful city in India. Because now those wide avenues have beautiful trees. People are picnicking there. I can think with all the new paradigms, those could be used for food production. They could be used to manage water. Everything that was criticized as being surplus suddenly becomes a robust infrastructure for all sorts of systems, right? Maybe by default, maybe unintentionally. But what I learned from Chandigarh was that cities you know, like the criticism of Chandigarh in the first 10 years was unfair. Cities take two or three generations to form, to be appreciated, to become functioning entities. Any city you look at, the, the, the idea of the instant city uh, uh, was a provocation. I don't think it can happen. And we see this all over the Middle East, right? and China, where they don't become cities for decades and decades and decades. And so Chandigarh, what the buildings did, uh, whether you like them or not, was they they 
they, they, they formed an identity for the city and became iconic for the city till the city grew around it. Unfortunately, in India, the paradigms have become rearguard action. It's not avant-garde. We are not ahead of the curve. Uh, planning is not anticipating growth. It's following and reacting to growth. And this is a huge problem in India. And I think the three landmark things that have happened in India in in the in the urban sector the first was in 84 rajiv gandhi the then prime minister full of young and full of vision appointed a, a commission to look at urbanization and and that commission was very important because it recognized two or three things it for the first time recognized these small towns that were growing and that had to be taken more seriously and it critiqued the fact that our imagination of urbanization or the urban india was the big mega cities and it took away the gaze from that. It was a very, very important thing that they flagged out. That was the first thing. The second thing was they identified that cities needed renewal. That means they needed infrastructure. A lot of our towns and cities had grown laser fare and infrastructure had not led the the way. And then the third thing they brought to the bear, besides many things like recognizing the interconnectedness between economy and livelihoods and all of that, they brought conservation on the table for the first time that cities needed conservation. That led to what I believe was the second most important thing in this trajectory of urbanization, which was the Jawaharlal Nehru Urban Renewal Mission, the JNRUM, which was an urban renewal mission, which was an accurate description of what urban India needed. It needed to be upgraded. It needed better water supply and electricity and drainage and, you know, better, uh, better common facilities, infrastructure, social, physical, all of that. And then... The third thing, which is too close to fully critique right now, is the Smart Cities mission, which I believe personally is a repackaging of the JNRUM to make it resonate more broadly with what the world is doing. But in my view, it's also a ridiculous rubric because uh, the smart city implies the use of the digital in the city and the digital implies the networking of existing systems in the city. But when you don't have existing systems, systems in the city what are you networking so therefore there is it's it's ironic that they've used a rubric like this i had a student who did a very interesting master's thesis on it an indian student and i got her to look at all the tender documents for the 100 smart cities that had been announced and what they were spending their money on and nirmal it was ridiculous it was uh Huge amounts of money on a biking path in Bhubaneswar. So my student went to bike on that path. Uh, she had to literally walk with her bike because that biking path had been occupied by hawkers. There were people sleeping on it because it was a wonderful paved zone, which was suddenly a new zone in the city, right? It was not reacting to the real problems of the city. It was bringing a global imagination of trying to make this sort of cool paradigm of making a bike biking lane for the city completely irrelevant in that city given 40 other more important problems they were parks that were being developed there were fountains being put in, in in community spaces the money was going into what was actually renewal it had nothing to do with smartness as we imagine it with digital interface so that is ironic and i think we have to give it more time to see where it lands I'd like to pause a minute to remind listeners that you can view each project discussed here at ecogradia.com. There, you'll find notes and links that'll help you get more out of this episode, including information on Rahul Mehotra and our sponsor for this season, the Wholesome Foundation for Sustainable Construction. Interestingly, Rahul is one of 465 experts from 49 countries listed in the Wholesome Network. All have contributed to the Foundation's events and publications over the years. This network is remarkable for its diversity of people and the significance of their work. It includes several Pritzker Prize winners like Alejandro Aravena from Chile, Anne Lacaton and Jean-Philippe Vassal from France, and more recently Francis Carey from Africa. The Foundation's website also contains a repository of publications that tackle the complexity and richness of conversations taking place across the world. If the goal is to understand when and why pathways to sustainability converge, well, this is the place to start reading. Rahul Mehotra's essays on the Kinetic City can be found in two publications linked to the Wholesome Forums, Shanghai 2007 and Detroit 2016. To find out more about Wholesome Foundation experts, events and publications, go to wholesomefoundation.org. I, I want to read a quote um, 
that you uh, made on the liberalization of the Indian economy in the 90s. And you said that the first and foremost impact of liberalization in India was the state absolving itself of responsibility of delivering public goods or planning for that matter. And this was a real problem through the decades of really the 80s to the 2010s. This has, in the first couple of decades, resulted in agricultural land being colonized on the periphery of Indian cities. It has ravaged the countryside in terms of a development model. This has resulted in incredible disruption of broader ecologies in and around the cities, yeah. on the periphery of cities. So in 1992, to be accurate, a process that started in 1986 or seven with our Prime Minister Narsimha Rao, but was taken to its logical conclusion by about 1992, uh, India liberalized its economy, which means it basically removed many checks and licenses and the flow of capital from outside India, uh, you know, and that's what is implied by the liberalization of the economy, uh, which till then didn't happen. And as someone had once said that um, India was a, a unique case where uh, for three decades they had imposed sanctions on themselves. Uh, and uh, so that liberalization is what we call the liberalization of the economy, I guess. Now, what that did uh, for 10 years was put us in this kind of gray space, which is that the state, which by then had become rather inept, uh, at delivery, which is, you know, what the society there recognized, whether it was delivery of housing, whether it was getting the economy going, uh, etc., uh, you know, uh, led to a moment where uh, the state began uh, dissolving or devolving its responsibility on many, many very important aspects of life, uh, whether it was infrastructure, housing, and it was leaving the space for fri private enterprise to step in. Now, in retrospect, when I look at it, I think uh, that transition should have been much better orchestrated uh, in that uh, the transition is also a complicated movement. And I think that really uh, wrecked havoc in our cities because suddenly you had other development models being superimposed. You had disruptions in the landscape where, you know, uh, say, for example, slum redevelopment, what they, the government said, OK, you know, we can't do this. So if you're a developer, you come and redevelop the slum. We'll give you 50 percent of the land to use for profit and the other 50% you house everyone. That is a great example of this. So you began to have disruptions where in the middle of nowhere, you had these high rise buildings and then you had this very high density six story buildings for slum dwellers, right? Again, a perpetuation of the binaries we were discussing earlier, spatialized, right? And there were no rules set for any of this. So I think the transition would have been better if we had imagined the transition, if the guidelines, the rules, uh, where does private enter price actually intervene? How do they intervene? What are the rules by the... It became a free-for-all in a sense. The same thing happened on the periphery of our cities because agricultural land to convert to uh, to uh, urban land, urbanizable land, was the, the, the it was almost an impossible thing to do in India because agriculture and the rural economy was very protected under our kind of socialist impulses in terms of our ideological leanings. It was also at this time that uh, the ideas of the idealized city began to emerge. I, I want to quote something you wrote in an article for, called Landscapes of Democracy, which I thought was incredibly interesting. You said, politicians use cities like Dubai and Shanghai as metaphors, emblematic of what might be modernity. But you know, what you forget, or even politicians forget when they use these metaphors, is that these are landscapes of autocracy. They're not landscapes of democracy. The political governance structure in India has not produced the fruits of deep democracy. I mean, you define deep democracy as poor communities able to enter partnerships with more powerful organizations. Is democracy as it's practiced in India today the problem? You're asking me a very difficult question. So let me just sort of back off uh, a little bit to, to situate this question, which is that, uh, you know, my reference to the Dubais and Shanghais uh, was also at a moment where India was trying to liberalize. And these cities, whether it was Singapore, Dubai, Shanghai, while they were autocracies, were becoming around the world emblems of competency. Uh, that means emblems of being able to attract capital, realize that capital very quickly and create 
very efficient infrastructure uh, that uh, people could, you know, benefit from. And that's why India took this sort of root in a democracy and therefore what resulted was very uneven development. So we had swanky international airports that got built which gave us this image of competency when people arrived but they left the airport and you know they were stuck in a traffic jam, they were passing slums, <laughs> they went to their hotel and there was no electricity you know or whatever might have happened. Right now this is a very particular paradigm which I've also written about which is what I call the architecture and cities of impatient capital because because capital is intrinsically impatient and it needs to find places which offer it very little friction uh, where it can realize its value. Uh, and so the, it, this is a combination where when you have an autocracy where decisions can be smoothly made, and I, I'm separating autocracies from dictatorships and all the political baggage that goes with it, an autocracy where where, where decision-making is centralized, that it can be very efficient in terms of assuring and attracting capital, and you get a particular kind of city. Now, that is one paradigm. I think it's silly for us in India to replicate that paradigm because the broader ecology in which the political, social, economic ecology in which uh, cities like that grow doesn't exist in India. And so it's becomes they become aberrations, actually, rather than the norm. That money spread out differently could create incredibly powerful solutions. And when I say differently, I mean in the form of social infrastructure, in the form of all the working systems of the city, which make the foundation for any city. Instead, what we are doing is using these instrumentally to create this illusion of competence. As the famous anthropologist Arjun Apudurai, he described them once as the weapons of mass construction uh, that were disrupting our Indian uh, cities. He's the one who coined the term deep democracy, Arjuna Pudarai, the anthropologist, where he said deep democracy is a condition where, uh, you know, there can be a conversation, a negotiation between the grassroots and most more powerful forces. Now, in a democracy to function, civil society becomes that bridge. And what do I mean by civil society, at least in my understanding, is that part of society that has the wherewithal as well as the empathy to make that connection and negotiation between the grassroots and more powerful forces. So trade unions are a part of civil society. NGOs, activists, foundations, universities, these are all parts of civil society, right? Now, for a democracy and deemed democracy to survive and to function, it needs civil society. And I think Unfortunately, in India today, what is being stifled the most is civil society. And if we don't have a robust civil society, we'll never have deep democracy. We'll slip into autocracy. So what then would you consider a good role model for urbanism in India? I would consider many of the emerging models from South America, Latin America, very good models. The one uh, city I have studied in some depth is Medellin in Colombia. And I think that is a fantastic model of how the state, civil society, the academy uh, all began to intersect. Uh, I think what's outstanding is that they focused on social infrastructure all the way from libraries to community centers to uh, investment in their stations for the public mobility, their parks, uh, etc. But what they also did brilliantly there, and that again is where context matters, is where by introducing the cable cars, because in the case of Latin America as opposed to Asia, in Asia the, the, in Asia, the informal cities, the slums as we refer to them, are always in the lowest lying lands that were most susceptible to flooding, etc. And the high lands were always occupied by the rich. In the case of Latin America, it's the reverse, where whether it's Rio or whether it's Medellin, the highlands have the favelas and the lowlands have the rich. And so the uh, favelas were very cut off by the from the economy of the city and the commuting time was huge. And so they created an infrastructure through cable cars uh, where the hillsides with cable cars could get people very quickly into the metro system and cut their mobility time and their safety and you know exponentially increase uh, their efficiency. Uh, and so... Uh, the lesson from those places is that is the investment in infrastructure is the best way to reinforce the commons. It is a great way to bring civil society to that interface and therefore in the process reinforce democracy. 
Um, I, there was a there was a line that you quoted in a lecture in 2018, uh, which I find intriguing. You said you can't think of the urban through architecture, unlike in the West. Now that's an interesting point. Seeing urban through architecture, or for that matter, vice versa. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, there are architects who would argue that buildings might be designed in ways that come together to form larger networks and therefore become urbanism or micro-urbanism. Is there a right way to do this? Well, I'm not sure if there's a right way to do this, but I think there are ways we can think about this. Uh, And uh, to enter that kind of answer, you know, one of the things that I I find interesting, uh, and this also has implications on pedagogy, and we can go there if you like, uh, which is that in the world today, what is happening, and especially I think for our profession, maybe in many other professions, is that our spheres of concern are expanding exponentially and our spheres of uh, influence are diminishing exponentially, right? So there's this big gap. It is really a question of how we teach and learn and do the 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 kind of moves of calibrating these two concerns and influence. And the way we do that is that we think more and more about nestled scales. That means we become aware that no scale of our operation is autonomous, right? And we have to be conscious as in as designers. Design is a reiterative process. And so we should take that reiterative thinking that is designers, we are very well equipped to do, right? We look, we, you know, we look at a facade and then we zoom into the window. We look at the way it's subdivided. We zoom back and we find the subdivisions doesn't work. So we go back and make the glass bigger, etc. We take that to an other scale. So the building sits on the street, which sits in the neighborhood, which sits in the city, which sits in the territory, right? These are nestled scales and we have to become facile at being able to go through those scales very, very quickly. Not not to design at every scale, but to let every scale inform the other scale, to be inspired by the other scale, to be nourished by the other scale, and simply to be aware of the implications of your intervention at any scale on the other scales. That is the kind of interconnected thinking that I think uh, will make better communities, will make us better professionals, and I think will expand our spheres of influence. One of the reasons we have no influence is we, have, we are seen as uh, as as irresponsible, which means we don't take the responsibility uh, or even think about the responsibility of our uh, interventions. And I mean, you yourself, you've talked about soft thresholds, yeah, yeah. which I think is a very a very interesting uh, notion yeah. of that kind of carries down the scale uh, of what we talk about in the city to what that means at the scale of the building. That's right. I mean, the, the KMC uh, corporate uh, office is a really ex- um, excellent example of soft thresholds. Uh, and if, I'll just take a minute to describe it because I think it's it's a really uh, a good case in point of what you're talking about. So it's an it's an office building in the city of Hyderabad, five to six stories high, fairly orthogonal block, double skin facade that has a vegetated external screen. Now many. In our discipline, we'll talk about vegetated facades as a question of shading or biomass, but you talk about it as a social innovation. So 20 gardeners who work within this facade on catwalks. And I quote from your an interview in 2021, you say, the gardener walks on the catwalks and look into the con- looks into the conference room and makes eye contact with the bosses while they're attending the garden. That's a soft threshold that those gardeners otherwise would not come into contact with their employers. I think this is a really... Uh, interesting idea of how we take ideas of edge conditions, the nestled nestled nature of scales that you talk about, by designing edges. Am I right? Uh, it's The magic is in the edge. It's about that conversation between scales. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the interface of the scales, how you transition from one scale to the other, what are the thresholds you make. But Nirmal, your alluding to the peripheral conditions of the city, yes, that is a situation, that is also a scale. And I think for me, when we talk about nestle scales, I don't mean we solve the problems at every scale, we just become aware of the implications 
and the learnings that we could extract from each other, right? That'll make the city, in a sense, more consistent in its own sort of value uh, spectrum. And so it, it, you can you can look at this notion of a threshold in very nuanced terms. Uh, they happen as very hard thresholds at borders and country crossings. They happen as soft thresholds in spaces that want to embrace you, like religious sites. Yeah, I mean, I, you, you talked about the design being uh, the synergy of binaries and then therefore design must be about the threshold between the binaries. So, you know, in, in the KMC building, the other thing, I think that happened by default. Actually, a lot of things that we did at the KMC building, I must very honestly admit to you, were intuitive. Uh, we never sat down and said, how do we create social empathy? A friend of mine, Sanjay Prakash, who is a well-known energy expert and architect in in India, Nirmal, of course, you're familiar with him, yes. uh, said to me in passing one day, because of course I showed him the building, I wanted to get his feedback. And he said, you've created true green jobs. So I said, Sanjay, what do you mean by that? What are green jobs? He said, no, what I mean by this is that the identity of this powerful corporation is now dependent on its lowest paid workers, because if the facade is not kept well, the identity of the building suffers. And, you know, for me, that was a, a one Wonderful insight that he provided. Whereas, how that is a form of empowerment, right? It's a form of uh, of empowering people uh, through the spatial qualities of the building. So, designing soft boundaries in the physical world means understanding the social and economic relations between groups, and that puts the architect in the role of a mediator. Let's take the example of Hathi Gao, in which you had to mediate between multiple clients and users. So the Hatigaon project was a very interesting project. It was a competition that happened in 2007 and we happened to win it. It was a project for uh, a low cost housing, which is a housing project for low income group. In this case, Mahuts. Mahuts are people who look after elephants, uh, are elephant keepers uh, and for their elephants. So a uh, hundred homes is what the competition was about. Uh, and the project, um, you know, has many nuances uh, because it's about multi-species. It's about trying to build a habitat for elephants in a uh, in a desert climate of Rajasthan outside Jaipur uh, and, you know, many sort of constraints like that. But the thing that the project was really characterized by was the fact that it took about 12 years to happen because, you know, every time a new government came into power, they just put the project on the back burner because one party had started the project. So it was an interesting question on who you build for, who is your client, right? Because uh, what the public works department had as their aspiration was quite different from what the mahouts and the elephants needed even, and what the chief minister had as their her aspiration or his aspiration. And in reflection, what one learned from the project is that we have to look at our the, the, the notion of the client in a much more nuanced way. And so just for a kind of simplistic nuancing of this, let's break it down into three parts. And so what I realized, and looking back to all my projects, I began to see this in very clear terms, which is that you have a patron client, that is the client who brings their aspirations, their monetary power, whatever it might be to the table. Uh, they define the problem and they have their aspirations. Uh, in the case of the government, in the case of Hathi Gao, it was uh, the chief minister. In the case of a university, it's the president of the university, uh, right? In the case of a corporation, it's the person who owns it or the board or the executive director or whoever it might be. Then you have an other client that's embedded in this larger definition of the client, which is the operational client. And the operational client in this case were all these agencies I just described that were changing, the public works department, then later the forest department, etc. And their aspirations are completely different, each one of them. And then you have the user client. In the case of Hathi Gao, it was... Uh, the elephants and the mahouts, which we had to be sensitive to. In the case of a university, it would be uh, the user clients with the students and faculty and the administrative staff. And the operational client would be the campus architect or engineer or campus planner, right? Uh, in the case of uh, a corporation, it would be, you know, the patron client would be the owner or the executive director. The operational client would be uh, the project manager uh, in charge of civil work for the company. And the users would be the office staff and everyone else, right? And so 
Each of these have completely different aspirations, and often the architect is the only one who can bring them all to the same table, because sometimes they don't even have internal communication. So therefore, what does one learn from this? What one learns from this is that the architect, as part of civil society in these more complex projects like Hatigao, has to play the role of the bridge between these different constituent members of the client. And I think if you can get these clients or these different aspects of the clients to come to the same table, then you get a good project. It's often not all frictionless. And that's why when they all come to the table in terms of aspirations and intent in a single family house, often it's just one person, it's much easier. In this conversation that takes place at the drawing board, you know, between uh, different interest groups. One new player, and I I say new advisedly because it's been almost two decades, uh, is the green building movement, who's become a new kind of civil society looking after uh, the interests of uh, the environment uh, in the building sector. What is your view of certification? Is it a, a good thing? I I think any metrics to measure is always very useful. Uh, The question is, uh, at what point does it get corrupted or at what point does it get counterproductive? And I think we have to keep recalibrating that critically. So in the case of, say, for me, at least the LEED certificate, it became, uh, it it got completely co-opted by the green building industry. So therefore, it became about make a problem and we'll find you a solution, right? So you have double sealants, double glazed glass, very efficient fans. So it's a green industry that emerges from it rather than going to the root of the problem, right? In the way we deal with our lifestyles, the way we bring our aspirations to our material investments. Now, maybe that's being too idealistic. But again, here context matters. And I think the hegemony of the LEED certification at a global scale is problematic. And that's why now in India with Graha, etc., I think there are more contextualized metrics for this. When we were doing the KMC building, which is the building which is four or five stories high, it has a green facade, which is not a green facade that's stuck on the facade, but it's a green layer, uh, which actually acts as a screen, which is humidified. So it creates passive cooling, etc. We could not get a LEED certificate. We got so many negative points because our windows weren't sealed. But we said, actually, we want the windows to be openable so the air can go through with the humidity into the space. And that wasn't the mark we could tick off on the original LEED certification, right? Uh, it, the requirements for the kind of HVAC, etc. were not even affordable. Uh, now with Greha, of course, they've privileged passive cooling, they've privileged points for many other aspects. And so I think these metrics um, evolve. Uh, I think the problem with metrics is when they begin to get uh, into a kind of hegemonic kind of condition. And therefore, we have to be very aware context matters. And these metrics must be very sensitive to context, cultural practices, social norms, and economies. Maybe just to clarify, uh, Greha is a uh, indigenous uh, uh, green certification tool yes. uh, for f- uh, in India, yeah. uh, and it is different from LEED in, in that it takes a lot more of the local context uh, into account and embraces aspects like passive cooling and things which are harder to measure sometimes, uh, but at least it brings it into the gamut of the discussion. One thing that intrigues me about about you is that you divide your time between Mumbai and Boston. And how does that work for you? I mean, does one vantage point help the other? Do you find yourself having to adjust adjust your focal length every time you move? Nirmal, that's a very good question. And um, uh, it's something that I continue to reflect about. And uh, I'm not sure if I can answer it in very pointed ways. But what I can say is my work all continues to be about South Asia and India in particular. My projects are situated there, my research, my studio, my writing, my teaching about informal cities, all of that focuses on India as the site of interrogation, learning, reflection. Because when I go to India, I'm on the ground, My I'm like blinkered eyed, I'm like focused on very little things. And then I can come back here and get a much broader view. And the context of the context is a notion where as as architects, we think of the context in material terms, you know, uh, the site, the soil condition, the climate, the wind direction. Some of us are more um, ambitious and we excavate the site for its 
hidden histories and that make that part of our understanding of the context. But that context, however nuanced it might be, it is about a particular locality and a location. And if you place that in its broader context, which is the context of the global shifts occurring, the flux of climate, uh, the political situation in India, and all of that, you begin to start getting other forms of nourishment and intersections in ways one imagines the values that one brings to one's practice. And I think it's really... I've become more and more conscious about developing and articulating what those values might be through this rubric of the context of the context. And that's why I say I, I feel very blessed that I have the privilege, the opportunity to be able to uh, retreat from a very intense ground reality that I'm engaged in when I'm in India uh, and have the space to reflect and reflect in a way that it is also a process of dissemination because finally uh, it allows me to communicate and articulate to another generation uh, what uh, you know I am seeing through that reflection. That generation, and I'm sure there have been people who've asked you many times uh, how you define success. So if to a young person who's uh, aspiring to make a mark as you have, what should they do? Well, I mean... I, I'll say this, um, uh, you know, in two or three ways. One is, I think, um, I would say that um, uh, I think I think we have to finally find a way to make our talk walk, uh, to put it very simply, uh, which means, again, this goes back to what we discussed earlier, Nirmal, which is how our spheres of concern and our spheres of influence have become disproportionately matched, the concerns becoming much larger than what our influence is. And I think aspiring to make our talk walk and calibrating what we are talking with what we are walking at all moments of our life and being self-critical is a good way that you uh sometimes without realizing it also evolve a set of values that you sometimes most often actually bring intuitively to projects. But having done that, you must, and I think we all have the responsibility to go back and step back and critically look at what we have done. And that's where writing or more spontaneously reflecting with you in interviews like this should become part of our repertoire. It shouldn't become, okay, those guys only practice and these guys only write and talk. I think we all have to do it simultaneously. Uh, and I think it'll nourish all of us, uh, which is not to undermine the fact that pure academics do academics and of course they should continue doing this but i think practitioners should more and more find formats spontaneous ones like this which are interviews that's why a format like yours is so critical to forced writing to reflect because that is also a form of commitment and so this is my call to the younger generation that carve time out for this self-reflection uh, and it will only propel the way you think about the future and the values that you bring because finally we shouldn't worry about the consistency of our aesthetics we should worry about the consistency of our values one final act of reflection. Apart from the things that you strive to do through your work, what do you think needs to happen to get us to the world that you imagine? Uh, I can't uh, claim to be someone who's yet walked my talk on this because I fly across the globe and all of that. Uh, but, you know, I think I, I can't tell you how much I how much it resonates in my mind and I'm reminded of that famous Gandhi quote which said that this planet is enough for our needs but not our greed uh, and related to that is our lifestyles right uh, I think if we have to get to where we want to get to which is you know more than clear now uh, I think it's 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 a lifestyle question uh, and I think one of the things that the pandemic by default has shown us is has moved us into this virtual world Nirmal otherwise either you would have been flying here or I'd have come to Singapore uh, and we would have done this podcast right uh, so the fact that I think the pandemic world has uh, complicated at least for me in my mind uh, the notion of the home and the world and that relationship uh, of the home and the world in classic terms, uh, I think might make us make those lifestyle changes. And I don't mean lifestyle only in terms of flying across the globe, but in everything we do and everything we appreciate and everything we put and bring value to. Uh, I think that is so critical. Buildings are not going to find the solutions for us. Uh, our cities are not going to find the solutions for us. But our lifestyles, the way we extract from the planet, the way we replenish the planet is all linked to 
lifestyle. And finally, I think、uh, we need to have a more serious conversation about that. Well, I'd like very much to have that conversation with you someday. That and the question of ethics is something that the discussion of sustainability keeps circling back to. Rahul, thank you very much for taking the time to be with me today. You've been engaging, to say the least. Thank you also to our listeners for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to hear more, subscribe to EcoGrad here on any directory or listening app where you find your podcasts. You can also find all our episodes and related notes at ecogradia.com. Don't forget to follow us on social media and recommend us to friends and colleagues. And remember, check out our sponsor, the Holcim Foundation for Sustainable Construction, at holcimfoundation.org. The seventh cycle of the Holcim Awards is around the corner, and the site already lists a few key changes to the award. Do check it out. Finally, thank you to the EcoGrad. Team, Ecogradia's producer Maxim Flores, editorial assistants and Matthews and Amelia Dulipala, a sound technician and editor Kelvin Brown at Flogiston. Thank you guys. Until we meet next, this is Nirmal Krishnani signing off in Singapore.